God is not imputing sin to you anymore, but the church will not only impute it, they'll compute it. Welcome to New Covenant Grace Fellowship in beautiful Citrus County, Florida. No roaring applause or anything. <laughs> Y'all don't know how to have fun. we got to have some fun. You know, it's important to have fun. How's everybody doing this morning? Third time I've asked y'all, and y'all are still doing good. Chris, can we get Ephesians, the first chapter? I'd like to start in verse uh, 6. 6 through 8. So, Matthew... Uh, Pastor always talks about titles and stuff. The, the, title, the title for this would be probably two parts. I would probably say that sin is not an issue anymore because the payment far exceeds the debt. So we could probably stop with that right there. But we won't. Uh, one of the things... Uh, I just want to give you a little background. I did not want to minister on this stuff this morning. Um, yesterday morning at about 4 o'clock in the morning, everything changed. And you hear that all the time, but it's true. And it's like you prepare for stuff, you prepare for stuff, and it's all for you. And then God changes everything and gives you what he wants for his people. So I'm cool with that because I learn a lot through it. it I text pastor this morning at about, I guess, about... 536 and I had to I had to put down I just had to put everything down because you get so excited that you really can't make any sense out of anything because all you want to do is go like this you just want to throw your hands up in the air when you see some of the stuff that Jesus has done for us you know and and it's hard I, I give pastor a lot of credit Emmett a lot of credit anybody that ministers every week because it's hard to get past that excitement. It really is. It's pretty ex exciting, you know. I mean, what, what Jesus has done for us. So, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Now we're going to go to Galatians 3.13. These are my two base scriptures, and then we're going to probably go to Isaiah chapter 53. Galatians. Yeah, there she is. All right, Chris. Wow. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law. Which says it's through obeying a law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us or redeemed us, for you King James people, from the curse pronounced by the law. We can go to Isaiah 53, and we're going to do that in the, in the King James Version. And the reason why I'm going to do it in the King James Version is because I know I'm okay to use whatever version I want to use right here. But we are... People are watching our videos, and there's people that are on the Internet watching our stuff that will click right off if we're not using the King James Bible. They will. I have a family member who will not read any other Bible than the King James Bible, and I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about a family member, and he, and he would stand up and say, and he, and he would agree with me, but he, he would say that the, any other version than the King James Version of the Bible is no good for a Christian to read. So today we'll use the King James just to show some of these things here. I encourage anybody here to... to go over... I'm up there looking for it. It's not there to go over this stuff when you go home. Take a little time. Take a little time to go over this stuff. You know, in that last verse that we read, the, when, he, when he redeemed us from the curse of the law, okay? Thank you, Chris. 
what we're going to find out through Isaiah here is that this curse of the law was not just the curse pronounced in Deuteronomy 28, okay? It's got a lot to do with our emotions and our feelings too, okay? Um, I, I, mean, I can only use myself. I, I could probably pick some other people out in here to use, but I can really use myself a lot better. I have done some things in my life to myself, to my family, and to a lot of other people that were not very nice, okay? It would be so easy to allow that stuff, even though I'm born again, redeemed, and, and walking in the spirit most of the time, uh, to let that stuff control me, okay? It would be easy to let my my conscience, you know, feeling guilty about some of the things that I've done in my past to control me. But I've had people say to me, you have no conscience at all. You don't feel sorry for anything that you've done. And that's true. Jesus literally paid it all. I don't care what you can come up with. Look, if you can say Jesus paid it all, but I was sexually molested as a child, or I was whatever you can put in that category, Jesus paid for that too. He paid for that stuff. He paid for that stuff. You know, there'll be some people on the Internet won't like to hear this, but when you go through Isaiah... And you literally look at the, you know, I love that Corinne was using the, the Strong's Concordance. I didn't even read this stuff out of my Bible. I went right to the Strong's and I looked at every word, what the meanings are, because it's so very important for me. Because I don't want to have to worry about anything physically, emotionally, any of that stuff attaching itself to me and causing me to have problems in my life. I want to focus on what Jesus did for me. I want to constantly renew my mind with that because that's what causes me to be victorious in life. Praise the Lord. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form, no or nor, no comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That's talking about Jesus. That's so powerful to me. Jesus, Jesus was just a common man here on this earth. To me, when I look at Jesus, you know, you always think, well, if Jesus would hear, he would do it this way, he would do it that way. No, Jesus was a humble man person on the earth and he he was just plain he wouldn't stand out in a crowd he wouldn't stand out in a crowd there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance nothing to attract us to him that's our savior that's this is isaiah prophesying about him okay so let's go to the third verse and do it. Thank you. He is despised. So does anybody have any idea what despised means? Does anybody have any meaning? You know, the, the literal meaning to this, he is despised, means to hold in contempt. To be despicable. To be vile or worthless. He is despised and rejected of man. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Acquainted with grief. Acquainted means to know, and here's the kicker, to learn to know. Jesus learned to know all of our griefs. While he was here on this earth, 33 and a half years, his mission, part of his mission was to learn all of our grief. What does grief or deepest grief mean? My, my Bible read deepest grief. It means sickness. Strong's de definition means anxiety, calamity, 
calamity, an event causing great and often sudden damage or distress. Jesus was acquainted with all these things. Not just acquainted, but he personally, he learned to know. His mission here was to learn to know our grief. He had to know these things. He had to do all this stuff. This was his mission, okay? We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was nobody here on earth. He was despised. He was God in a human form. He was God in his human form. He humbled himself to come down here with the people whom he created. He created us in his image. They despised him. They rejected him. Remember, this is about the payment being much more than the debt. Don't let that for, don't let that don't lose that thought. The payment is a lot more than the debt, okay? The sin debt, sickness debt, poverty, lack, depression, anxiety, feeling sorry for yourself, self-righteousness, self-works. Payment far exceeds the debt. Let's go to Isaiah 54, uh, 53, 4. Sorry, Chris. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows this in the church. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him and stricken him, smitten of God and afflicted. Surely he has borne our griefs. Griefs in the Strong's means sickness and carried our sorrows. Sorrow means what? Pain. He carried pain. All pain. Not, I don't, you know, stub your toe pain, you know, cancer pain, headache pain. He carried all pain. He didn't leave anything out. He didn't leave anything out. We thought it was punishment. You know, what this is saying is we thought it was punishment for his sin. That God, that's what the NLT will say, is that we thought it was punishment for his, his sin. But it wasn't. It wasn't, a, it, it wasn't so much of a punishment. It was a, it was, he was carrying our debt. He carried our debt. And not just on the cross. He didn't just carry the debt on the cross. He carried the debt his whole life, and he grew in it. He learned to know everything that we would experience. Okay? He learned to know all that stuff. We can go to the next verse, Chris. Everybody knows this one, too. He was wounded for our transgression, transgressions. He was bruised for our, for our inequities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He was wounded. He was defile, defiled and ritually. And the king, and the strong says, relates this to sexually also. Look it up for yourselves. I'm not saying it. It's what they're saying. Okay? So it's important to remember this because we deal with people with sexual scars, whatever they are. Jesus bore that for us. He learned to know that. He took 33 years to learn that and learn it perfectly. He carried it for us. Okay? For our transgression against for our transgression. And the strong says against individuals, against what you have done to people. He carried that for you. Okay? He carried what nation and nation has done against one another. He carried what we've done against ourselves. And he carried what we did against God. He carried that for us. What well, is this is so real because it just starts to remove those things that hold you back. Jesus bore it so you didn't have to bear it. 
This is what it's all about. Jesus bore it so you don't have to bear it. It's not yours to bear. Oh, so let's just play double jeopardy with what G Jesus did. Okay? Jesus bore it so you don't have to bear it. Just, really, just let it go. It's okay. You can go through this stuff here and it will bring you revelation knowledge. It'll bring you peace. Okay, he was bruised for our, for our inequities or sin. Sin, guilt of sin, consequences for sin, and the punishment for sin was all put on him. What's left for you to bear? The chastisement or correction of our peace or completeness, soundness, welfare was upon him. And with his stripes, the bruising, the wounds, the blows, all that stuff, he, he healed us. He made us healthful and the strong says of individual sickness. Well, I didn't say that. That's what the strong says that Jesus did. He removed sin, sickness, disease. He removed, this is, you know, whatever you believe doctrinally, okay, you can't, if you're a Christian, you can't take this out of the Bible. He removes sin, sickness, disease, lack, emotional scarring, uh, any kind of guilt. If you want to carry it around, you can. But he removed it. He took the burden for that. God is not mad at you anymore and literally has never been mad at you since Jesus. Jesus took this. For us to feel that way, all we're doing is limiting what God wants to do in our life. We take on a condemnation, uh, you know, just a condemnation kind of persona. We're condemned about everything, beat up about everything, and it renders us useless. The literal meaning for the word of condemnation is a, is a, a damnation sentence, and you follow that out, and it just says it will render you useless. Where at? Well, righteousness, peace, and joy. That's where you'll be useless. You won't have any of that. Most people don't let the Word of God get in the way of what they believe. That's for somebody right in here because the Lord gave it to me. Most people don't let the Word of God get in the way of what they believe. I'll say it one more time. Most people do not let the Word of God get in the way of what they believe. Not only let it get in the way, let it just plow over what you believe. Because what you believe, if it's not based on this, is not profitable for you. You know, the Bible says the traditions of men do what? They make the word of God of no effect, null and void. That's tradition of men. We got a lot of tradition going on. I'm never going to get through all this stuff. We got a lot of tradition going on. Uh Go ahead and go to the sixth verse real quick. We, we'll get through some of this good stuff right here. All we, have, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened. You want to go to the next one, Chris? Okay. Yet he opened not his mouth. Boy, I like to meditate on this one because I have a tendency to open my mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare this his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich and, and with with the rich in his death i want to stop right there for a minute you know a lot of people when they when they look at this stuff there's a lot of stuff you, we can just keep reading on here i want to just point something out to you okay uh this, this verse right here, can, you know, 
this verse 9 right here is just, this is all prophetic stuff that Isaiah was talking about, okay? But if you go back and look at your Bible, you'll see right here that this, this verse right here is confirmed in Matthew uh, somewhere where Jesus is hung. He's hung, hung between two thieves and a rich man donated his tomb, right? So this is a confirmation to that verse. This whole chapter right here has more confirmation in it than pretty much anything in the Bible. There's more verses that confirm everything that Jesus did in here than, than just about anything else in the Bible. We're going we're gonna to put this on hold just for a second. I, I want to I say a couple things. Right now in the church, right now in the body of Christ, not in the church, I'm going to say in the body of Christ, there's three popular doctrines. Okay, and I want to deal with them, and not so much for for us here, but maybe for us here. I don't know. One, you know, all these doctrines. I'm not going to mention denominations or any of that stuff, but these three doctrines are, are really popular. Um, I want you, when I read these doctrines, I want you to think about one thing: which one of these? makes us righteous. Um, I also want you to think about the fourth doctrine that I'm not going to mention, but I'll say now, is the one where you don't need salvation, that you don't need to be born again, because there is a, there's, a, there's a particular group out there that teaches that. So the first doctrine, church doctrine, this is not a biblical doctrine. These are church doctrines that I'm going to talk about. The, okay? I'm not... Okay, I'm going to talk about this first one. Sin and lose your salvation. Confess, get it back. Save, lost, save, lost, save, lost, save, lost, save, lost. Save, lost, save, lost, save, lost. Oop, save, lost, save, lost. Oop, save, oop, save, lost. Oop, save, lost. Does it even make sense when you read something that come out of Isaiah? Why would God send his son to this earth and do what he did and, and to him to put you in a church, okay? Look, the church is mostly, the, the church is, mo the, God is not imputing sin to you anymore, but the church will not only impute it, they'll compute it, okay? This doctrine is poison. It's like a cancer. It's a poison, Okay? You know, you're backslid. Now you got to come up, get born again. Every weekend, I just testimony that I heard that kind of rings in my ear all the time is Shannon saying, I, I felt like I had to go up every week and get born again. That's like a cancer. There is no freedom there, okay? The second one is not so harsh. It's sin and lose your benefits. You know, lose fellowship with God. He doesn't answer your prayers and stuff like that. Everybody knows what I'm talking about you know, because they've all heard that. But it's not biblical. And, and you can debunk that with, with all that stuff that we just read. You can really debunk that if you, if you look at it. You know, the old system of sacrifice. Let's just say sacrifice or confession. Let's, let's use sacrifice, okay? The old system, uh, under the old covenant, when David would bring a lamb for the sin that he committed, okay? What would he do with the lamb? So he would bring the lamb, and I'm not an old, I don't know this stuff. There's other people in here who probably talk to you about this old system. I don't even really want to focus on the old system, but I want to show you a point. They would bring that lamb to the priest. The priest would examine the lamb. He never looked at the person bringing the sacrifice. He always examined the lamb. The reason why I'm saying this is a lot of these, these first two doctrines that we, we see here are based on what the church calls confession and repentance, which we know is a changed mind. 
That's what repentance is. But the church will say repentance is confession of your sin. Okay? And there, there is some... Listen, I'm not going to go any further than that. Uh, but what I want you to see is the focus was never, not even in the Old Covenant, was it on the person. The focus has always been on the Lamb. The focus has always been on the Lamb. It's never been on you. The light's never been shining on you, focusing on you. It's always been focused on the Lamb. You'll never see in Scripture where when the priest brought, was given a sacrifice, that he inspected the person bringing the sacrifice. He looked at the Lamb. That is a shadow of the New Testament. The New Testament always looks at the Lamb. In Hebrews chapter 7, and you don't have to go there, but somebody go there when you get home, because this is, could be for you. It talks about the old sister, it talks about the, or, the Melchizedek, okay? It talks about the old system, okay, it calls it a system. The priests were all in the line of Levi. Every priest was from the tribe of Levi. That was what the old covenant law was based on. Every priest had to be from that tribe, okay? What tribe is Jesus from? Jesus is a high priest, an eternal high priest. What, what tribe is he from? He's from the tribe of Judah. When you have a change in priesthood, you have to have a change in law. It actually says it annulled the first agreement. That first system of sacrificing for your sin, whether it be confession, feeling bad or sorry for yourself, all that stuff is not helping you. All it's doing is giving you a sin conscience. That's all it's doing. Chris, can you put Isaiah 53.11 up? Remember what I just said. He always focuses on the Lamb. He, I'm going to look at verse 11 right here. He shall, talking about God, he shall see the travail of Jesus' soul and, she'll be, and, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Listen, God is not really satisfied despite what your pastor or church is teaching you with your confession. Okay? He's only satisfied with what Jesus went through. That's the sacrifice he's satisfied with. For us to do any other thing is really wasting our time and probably causing us a bunch of anguish in our life. It's what Jesus did that God's satisfied with. Remember, he always looks at the lamb. Always. It's not about me and you. We would like to think everything's about us, but it's not. It's not. I'm glad it ain't about me. You know, even today people think we have to suffer for sin. You know, there's it, some denominations, they have uh, Lent, Lent, you know, and people suffer for the sin and for their things that they did all year long, all year long they, they suffer. That's it's a waste of time. And I'm sorry for it. If you're on the internet and, uh, and I've offended you, hurt your feelings, I can't help it. It's not what I'm saying. It's what the Word says. Uh, as Christians, God gave us a mind to think. We are supposed to think. The whole New Testament, and we won't get there today, but the whole New Testament is designed to make you think. Think on what? Think on things that are, if you were here Wednesday night, we talked about thinking on things that are pure, lovely, praiseworthy, uh, and there's some other things in there. But go ahead and read it for yourself. It's what you need to be doing. 
Uh, it's designed to make you think. This whole thing today is designed to make you think. Think. Think, think, think. The third doctrine alive in the church, and praise God for it, is receive Jesus, and he makes you right with God. In this doctrine, we do repent. We change our mind on how we see sin today. That's what, that's what our repentance is. We change our mind on how we see how Jesus dealt with sin. He didn't deal with sin perfectly. He, he didn't deal with it until you come to him and then now you deal with it. <laughs> that don't make sense. Now, now you have to live up to a certain standard and, and you have to do this and you have to do this and work, 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 work. And it's all about the only work God wants from you, read it yourself and Google it if you don't know where it's at because I don't know where it's at right now either, but the only work God wants from you is to believe in Jesus. That's the only work and it's in Scripture. So anything else you're doing is on your own. It's not making God happy and you're wasting your time, and you're not getting... The only thing you're getting from it is probably some bad feelings. We repent, we change our mind about sin and its power, because sin has no power. The dominion of sin has been broken. And we focus on Christ. That gives us a Christ conscience, not a sin conscience. Uh, Chris, can we go to Hebrews 9? How long does your redemption last? Okay, so if, if, if we, the first two doctrines here that we dealt with, that is a temporary redemption. Those first two doctrines were basically dependent on you. They're not dependent on Jesus. If you're going to a church and you're hearing those first two doctrines where you're save, loss, save, loss, save, loss, save, loss, or when you mess up, you're, God's not going to answer your prayer, he's not going to do this for you, he's not going to do that until you get back right with him. Well, you know, it's like the old saying goes, you know, what if you die in a car accident and forget to repent, you know? Oh, my God. Man, God is really limited, and he must not have known the invention of the automobile was coming along, if you look at it that way. I mean, come on. You have to think about some of this stuff. And we got people all over the world today that are being fed this stuff. They're being fed. So, you know, you have made yourself the sacrifice for sin, and that won't work. That's not going to work. Okay, so Chris, can we get Hebrews 9, I think? Uh, I think so. Let's go there. We'll make it work. We can make it work. Is it? Look. Uh, well, that's not it. Oh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, without spot to God, purge you, purge your conscience from dead works? I think that's what it says. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the blood of Christ has purged that conscience, you know? to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator, not you. He is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the trans transgressions that we were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So, you know, we're pretty safe and secure. To be honest with you, everybody in here is okay. You know, one of the great things about being part of this church for me is that Pastor Larry, pretty much through all his stuff that he, that he teaches us, 
His main goal is to let you know you're okay. You're okay. You're okay just where you are. You're okay. Everything is okay. Everything's okay. We set our mind on Jesus. We all need transformation. You know, I can speak for everybody in here because I know y'all good enough. We all need transformation. Every day we need transformation. But it's okay. We're okay. There's no rush. There's no hurry. There's no travail. There's no beating yourself. There's none of that. It's okay. You're okay where you're at right now. You're okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the sin, the sin of the whole world has been forgiven. The whole world has been forgiven of sin. Remember, people, I'm closing up with this. The Lord said, stop. Remember, God is a spirit. He is not a human being. If it was up to me, I would go behind each and every one of you with a little checklist and say, yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, yep, I'll see you at the end of the week. We're going to get this straightened out. Do you want to look at me through the confessional booth or not? Because I got a list. That's not how God does it. That's not how he does it. I want to read one verse, and I want to leave you all with this. And you know what? I appreciate y'all. I thank y'all for allowing me to come up here and get this out of my system. Can you go to Ephesians again? Chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. You know, the, this first couple of verses of Ephesians explains redemption. It should be really simple to us, but we've really complicated it. Redemption is pretty simple, okay? Jesus paid it all so you don't have to. Not just in heaven, but right here on this earth. Look, we didn't talk about all that conscious stuff this morning. You know what? We could go in Hebrews. The Hebrews talks about purging your conscience and stuff was done. You don't have to feel sorry. You don't have to hold on to past hurts. You can let that stuff go. Depression, anxiety is covered. Sometimes we just need to know that Jesus took this stuff for it to be removed from us. Let's say that again. You know, I can use myself. I did not know for a long time what Jesus really did on the cross, even though I heard all Isaiah 53 preached. But when I started looking at that stuff and really digging into it, because there's I have only scratched the surface. That's it. That's it. And I don't want to give you any more because I would rather you go in there and find out for yourself. And I know some people in here do, but the, the real victory comes just for letting God reveal it to you. You know, my revelation may or may not work for you. Revelation knowledge is pretty powerful, but God has, you know, got, a, got an individual plan for each and every one of us. It just doesn't all, I mean, it's a corporate plan, but he also has individual ways of touching us, you know. So blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is so powerful right here. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Notice, it says absolutely nothing about what you did or didn't do. It doesn't say anything about that. He said He chose you. He chose you. You're chosen. And it's okay. We're all in good shape. So Father, I thank You. I thank You for a redemption. I thank You, Lord, that it's a very simple plan for very simple people. 
Father, I thank you that through your spirit, we can grab a hold of something that was said today and it'll make a difference in our lives. Father, I thank you that some of this stuff today will just take root in people's minds. It may cause them to get up at 1.30 in the morning. But Father, I thank you that if they do get up at 1.30 in the morning, that you provide a way of resting while we're awake. Lord, I thank you for the ability to think, ponder, and roll your word over in my mind while I move around and do the things I got to do this week. I thank you, Lord, that you give that same ability to each and every one of your believers and your word transforms their life. Father, I thank you for the most powerful force in the universe living on the inside of me. I thank you for that power. Resurrection power living on the inside of us. And I thank you for it, Jesus. Amen. Now, if there's anybody out there on the Internet that needs prayer or ministry, please contact us. And we just lift you up right now. We thank you. We bless you. We just speak a blessing over you. Uh, and you can contact us any way, shape, or form. Most of the time, 24 hours, 7 days a week if it's an emergency. We love you. And we just bless you.